Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for the recap of the Tour de France 2023, including the Stage 21 quick recap, the Champs Elysees stage yesterday. We're going to get into all the big discussion points, you know, which teams were successful or not successful during this Tour de France, including the non UAE, non Yumbo teams. Who was the breakout performer? The Tour de France, Derek G, like Rodriguez, perhaps, and also discussing for maybe future thinking what do Mm. yumbo need to do in the future if anything do uae need to change something up bring different riders to the tour or are they fine as well and it's does this pagacha need to change anything as well as rating the tour de france but yeah it's uh before the dust has settled too much we wanted to do this while it's fresh in the minds but yesterday from saint quentin or evelyn to paris champs elysees 114 k's the procession stage lots of photos taken and then they get there was Threats of rain, Benji. I think in the end they did take the GC times on the second last bell lap. Second last yep. lap. Correct. They did that because obviously maybe Yumbo asked them to do so because they might have the plan to draw back towards the finish line and have their bit of a ceremonial moment with the entire team behind the peloton. Maybe that's the reasoning. Wouldn't have mattered because he was so far ahead in GC anyway. But we did see a, a pretty interesting stage, as in lots of attacks and so forth. Pogacar are very active in those attacks. Really uh, fun to see. Nathan van Hooydonk not showing the real cyclismo, not riding with Pogacar, which in GC stage, you'd understand. In this stage for fun, I would have enjoyed seeing him ride. Alpecin did it doing the lead out in the end because it came back together because there were loads of teams doing the work for Alpecin, like Jaco, like Anton Marche, and it came to a sprint. And uh, well, I feel like Philipson kind of launched a bit late because other riders came over him already and it led to a different guy winning yeah but so christoph he was going to at the turn the right hand turn i thought philipson's going to win this easy because he was mm-hmm. fifth wheel rickart was doing the lead out at 700 800 and then it was morich christoph and christoph wasn't sprinting he was leading out and so i think philipson wins this sprint perhaps if Christoph doesn't go the wrong way around Morich. Christoph went the, to the barrier side mm-hmm. as Morich was pulling off barrier side and flicking. It was very similar to when Laporte decided to move ahead of Merku last year as Merku peeled off into Laporte's path. And that completely, that basically cost Philipson and Vanderpool, I would say, 75 free meters. And yeah. so Vanderpool starts his lead out at 475. Philipson doesn't want to launch at 250. Gronewegen does, though. And, you know, I understand it. He wants to basically box Philipson in, which he does. And he does put Philipson under pressure a little bit. The curious thing was Gronewegen could have safely gone to the barriers. He, yeah. he had jumped ahead of Philipson and he had, could just go in front of Vanderpool, who's slowing down and go to the barriers. He opens the door back up to Philipson, which you're not obliged to do. But yeah, tracking him was Pedersen, and then tracking him was Mayus, uh, and he just had the perfect timing and run in, and comes out of the uh, the Pedersen wheel and, and nails Philipson on the line and beats him with the throw. So huge win! <laughs> the last gasp uh, shuts up the naysayers. Benji, you said Bennett should have been taken. Um, <laughs> like me, like me. Wait, 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 wait! You're pointing it at me now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's, I still. I mean, you would have won on call that law, Sam Bennett. I feel it. <laughs> nah, it's a great win. Yeah, it's a great it win. Is. And it makes me wonder what else is possible. You know, like next year, there's rumors of Sam Wells for Tubora. Then we know that's a sprinter that hasn't been able to show himself too much because DSM doesn't know what way to go around roundabouts. But next to that, I was also like. Sam Walsford went into the attack yesterday in, in moves and breakaways, and that was probably the one stage where I wouldn't have done that. As in, you want DSM to go in attacks, but you don't want him to do it with their sprinter, because that's a secondary option at the finish line. But anyway, that stage is over. I'm curious what Mayos can show in the future. I'm curious what loads of sprinters can show in the future, because we've got a merry-go-around next year with all the transfers and so forth. But Philipson had a pretty... Uh, Bloody strong too, regardless of losing the stage, huh? Yeah, he did. And, you know, it's a, a bike throw photo finish away from five Tour de France stage wins, which should have equaled Kittle and Cavendish. But, yeah, Maus 
First World Tour win as a sprinter, being on Champs Elysees. I'm not. Has that ever happened before? That a, a sprinter has won on Champs Elysees, and that's their first World Tour level victory. It seems improbable when I think of uh, Van Aert, Bennett, Grenade, who else? Cavendish. Like, it's incredible, and um, it makes the tour for Bora. It bookends it very, very nicely for them uh, as well. So, I thought it was actually. I, I still to the last to the last gasp. Could mm -hmm. not believe Intermarche weren't putting Binny in the attack and Turnison in the attack. And in the, I, I, t I still couldn't believe they're riding for a sprint, but, um, you know, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing all over again. Expecting a different result. Um, but uh, Groenewegen and Jacob is a little bit different. I really did think he had a genuine chance to win. He is that fast uh, with, but, but, you know. He didn't have the, the last minute. Yep. So the, the best sprint trainer, best sprinters, clearly Jasper Philipson. Uh, but before we get into the, the jerseys of which he obviously won the green jersey, we wanted to say a big thank you to all of you who listened throughout the Tour de France. We broke all our listenership records, whether that's the Netflix effect, whether the Tour de France was that good, whether we're just that good. Um, <laughs> I'll let you be the judge. I think it's that. <laughs> it must be that, right? <laughs> But yeah, thanks everyone for listening. We we read all the comments uh, wherever they are on Twitter, on the YouTube videos, on the Spotify. Um, and thanks also for your support during the tour um, through the donation link. That was also incredible support. So I wanted to do a big thank you for that um, because that means we'll be going to the Vuelta in Barcelona, getting Benji, get him a little uh, sun hat. It's going to be hot in the August. Sun hat. Yeah, we're going to get you have to get Don't you some hat and sun screeners, bro. Don't you dare get me a bucket hat. Don't you dare. <laughs> I got the I got the Highland cow hat from the Worlds on order on order. I hope it gets here before Worlds. It looks so sick. Um but yeah, Benji and and Luke will be coming again for the Vuelta and then over up to Andorra for the first week at least. Uh and we'll be doing watch alongs like the Tour de France and that's thanks to your support. So thanks very much for all that. Anything you'd like to say, Benji? I just I want to regurgitate what you just said basically that Without people listening to us, without people watching our content, this wouldn't be possible. And getting the support, getting the feedback, the nicest thing about doing this is being able to see your opinion as well in the comments and maybe change our mind as a consequence or learn something new from you guys. It doesn't mean us having this podcast doesn't mean that everything we say is the law. So it's always fun when other people give their takes as well on the comments and so forth. Patrick with the, with the side eye. <laughs> Dude, I was getting cooked after stage 14. The YouTube comments in the pod were cooking me. Yeah, mate, you, you're, you were the biggest Pogacar fanboy, according to the comments. Well, no, and then other people were like, Patrick's been badly humbled. He's got to throw the <laughs> spreadsheet away. Spreadsheet, I think, was right in the end. But um, anyway, no, no, it, it's great. I reread all the comments. It's great that people engage with it. And of course, you know, we're, we're wrong all the time, just as much as we're right. And that's the fun of it. Um, having our opinions and seeing your all opinions, it's, it's great. And we won't stop doing it. So anyway, <laughs> enough of that. Uh, on to the KOM. First of all, Giulio Ciccone, a full team effort from Trek, uh, Little Trek. He wins it ahead of Felix Gull and Vingegaard, who both didn't really go for it. I'm really happy that a rider won it, as I've said before, who wasn't going for it. Uh, so who, who wasn't a GC rider who just won it accidentally. I still think Col de la Lowe's, it makes no sense to me that that was double points. I think that yeah. that had the potential to really ruin it. But uh, yeah, great from Little Trek and Chicone, and they win a stage and KOM. And it's better than a top 10. It's better than ninth on GC. Like, don't you reckon? You get to go on the podium, man. In Paris, and you have the the sick bike and everything. I, I if I was a sponsor, I'd rather Chicone than a ninth result. Ooh, uh, I think so as well. And it's also KOM's a pretty legendary thing, you know. It's like it's not the white jersey is not as memorable as the Polkadot jersey, for no. example. And the Polkadot jersey is really that oh that Panache jersey in the Tour de France. Come on, and I would like to add that not just Chicone has to be thanked for. That Cold La Loz being a non decider in the KOM, Gull kind of did that for them. So, yeah, Gull kind of made sure by being ahead, and some other GC right, breakaway riders as well made sure by being ahead that a Vingegaard would not take full points there. So, that's also a major effect here. And I like that it was a real battle this time. Like, towards the end, it became clear that Chicone was likely to take it because Gull didn't have the, the punch at the top of climbs, you know? So, it kind of was. Can Chicone stay ahead of GC riders? 
by the last mountain stage, and Trek pulled that off perfectly. And I I also like how much they they meme about it on on for example on Twitter on social media. There's like this this cartoon of a a white dog with like red polka dots on it in Italy, and Chicon has been memed as that dog for like the last week of the Tour de France. So I enjoy that kind of humor. The team supporting that stuff and yeah i um i can't complain chicone the thing is like the thing with chicone is he's had such an evolution eh? as in first stage wins in grand tours was his first bracket of things to do then towards gc at the start of this year he was a good gc rider in one week races whether he could do it in a grand tour that's that was questionable but he was supposed to ride the giro wasn't able to do that because he got ill if i recall correctly yeah. or something then ended up doing the tour de france and I was kind of worried he'd end up doing GC, but the team quickly made sure that it was obvious that Scalmosa was the GC rider for potential top 10, but Scalmosa then fell through. And I like how the team adapted to that. Peterson and Scalmosa on the stages that didn't fit them were perfect domestiques for Chicone, and they deserve credit for that. Yeah, great team performance. And every KOM sprint, they were trying something. They planned it the last stage, you know, they got in every breakaway. And that's why I think a lot of teams were slow to react to the fact yep. that in the third and second week, if you wanted to get in the breakaway, just just tag on to, just sit on Chicone, and he, then the break is not going to go without them. But yeah, great work from them. Their new sponsor, I think, will be quite happy because yeah, the, the Tour de France will promote very hard whoever is in the KOM jersey because Leclerc, another rival supermarket, coincidentally, sponsors the jersey, so they promote the shit out of it. Um, Green jersey. Jasper Philipson wins handily with a 119-point lead. Actually narrower than I expected, <laughs> that lead <laughs> over Pedersen. Uh, it was, to be honest, if you win four stages and come second in another two stages and fourth in another two or three stages. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, the green jersey was a foregone conclusion when he was so dominant. The It, it was a bit of a shame. I, I do like when intermediate sprints matter, but to me, not a single intermediate sprint in this entire Tour de France was of any importance or yeah. interest. Exactly, and it also quickly became uh, a lost battle because if if Philipson wins a lot in week one, then it becomes clear that he's going to win the race when it comes to the point jersey. We saw the same with Wout van Aert early on last, last year where we knew if, based on first week, that he was so far ahead already that he had so many points that it would be difficult for anyone to really compete with Wout van Aert for the green jersey. So the only difference there was that Wout was still going in breakaways, was still taking green jersey points and so forth. And like you say, the green jersey points, the, the gates, the intermediate sprints had no value at all in the in the second half of this race, probably in the first half either, to be honest. But I will say Alpecin circled themselves around Philipson and it paid off. Van der Poel did lead outs on the sprint stages. He didn't have that much individual success, but he was able to support the team when it mattered. And that led to probably at least one of the Philipson victories probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't Van der Poel leading him out. So that's a very valuable, very valuable rider there. Their behavior, we can't neglect it. It yeah. wasn't the nicest Tour de France when it comes to behavior from the team. And that goes with Philipson's behavior in sprints, Philipson's behavior on the road, Vanderpool's behavior in the lead out and so forth, and just the general feeling that I get when it comes to Alperson as a consequence of that is not that they're the, the most sportsmanlike team on the road, but when it comes to their performance, they kicked it out of the park. This completes their evolution as the new quick step, um, taking four <laughs> stages with the sprint, a dominant sprinter in green jersey. I think Vanderpool was sick during yep. this tour. He was coughing at the end. Like, he couldn't stop coughing in the final interview. So, how he, whether this was preparation for Worlds and he was tapering, you know, for Worlds just nicely, mm -hmm. I'd question that. Um, that's not in, that's in like two weeks. And yeah, he, to me, he looks sick. So, and, and you know, he's their big star. So, it takes good management to be like Jasper every day. We're going Jasper yeah. every day, like Limoges. You could tell Van der Poel wanted to go for that stage, I think. And um, he, he got told on the bus that, that morning that Philipson was their best chance. So, anyway. Honestly, I mean, yeah. when it comes to the management, the Rothhoff brothers, I feel like they kind of look like good cop, bad cop between the two of them. As in, one of them 
seems to be the guy that makes the rough decisions, while the other one is like the emotional character they can they can rest upon, is how I view it from the TDF Unchained series of last year. But I will say that I kind of like it online if you had to grasp an idea of who these two people are based on the reactions on the TDF Unchained series, then they would actually be portrayed as some kind of psychopaths according to social media. They were actually getting roasted for how they acted in that to the Franz Unchained episode. Well, really? But I, I, I like that because a management that is able to make the right decisions at the right time is what leads you to, to victory in these kind of races. And I feel like their management is really on point. They were in front of it a few years ago when it comes to um, the UCI points and so forth and their, their benefit of the first few spots in Pro Conti, for example. Like, their entire evolution as a team, they've been making the right decisions, I feel like. Yeah, generally speaking. GC, some of the... They have let yeah. two talented GC riders go in Vine 100%. and Talit, um, but they probably have doubled down on what they think they're good at, which is fit sprinters. Like, they brought Groves in, fit sprinter, and, and that's what sort of is their wheelhouse. But yeah, no one's perfect, but with the budget they have, they, they outperform that, and... Yeah, outstanding, really, the way the team is going. A um, few minor things aside. Uh, we'll skip white jersey. It's not really... It's the last year Pogaccia wins it. Uh, That's so sad. Who, uh, it should be Rodriguez or Ayuso next year. Is Remco still eligible? How old? I don't know. I think he is. It's like the end of an era, the fact that Pogaccia can't win the white jersey anymore. I think four he's got row. four, which is, a, which is a record. So, um, I don't know. I'm looking forward to see who he has it next year, but it's going to be between the riders you are. Uh, you mentioned I use Oremko and so forth, and can't wait for that battle. But we've mentioned the the KOM points, we mentioned the points, and we mentioned the white jersey. Let's take a look at the teams for a second, because there's been a lot of teams in this race. A few that might as well have not started, because I I didn't see a few of them very much in this race. But there's also teams that knocked it completely out of the park, and I think one of the first teams I want to mention to you is, for example, Bahrain. I feel like they, like, Mikel Anda rode as if he's watched, but the rest of the team delivered. Moric stage win, Wadpool stage win, Bilbao stage win, and then 16 GC from yeah, Bilbao, obviously. top five, 10 seconds off fifth. Benefited from Hindley's crash, but that doesn't matter. That's what happens in cycling, eh? So the game is the game. And he was super strong in the break on Cold La Lowe's. Like, he got in that break, Hindley didn't get in that break. Rodriguez didn't yeah. get in that break. And so that's where Simon Felipe, Yates, <laughs> and um, Bilbao and Godou, they all took time. So, yeah. yeah, I think Bahrain had an outstanding Tour de France. They just keep winning. They know how to win break stages. They just, they always, they put the right riders in. They put multiple riders in. Those riders make the right moves at the right times. They have good race feel. They get in the right, they target the right stages with those profile of riders. I will say, well, Poole's performance is... One of the most surprising things, like in the tour, mm -hmm. it's kind of gone under the radar how strong he was. The fact that he did from the breakaway on Betex, he did that climb, I think, like faster than all the GC riders, but five or six of them. So, and then it was kind of not, I don't know, we didn't really see him again. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> they, they picked it the right, he, he and Bilbao and Morris, outstanding. Haig was good helping uh, Bilbao and the GC and low. So, and right too, you know, probably not the tour he would have hoped for. And they lost Bauhaus. Like they would have got even more points, but he got sick or yeah. something. He week actually two had or three. solid sprints. I think he bought him the, yeah. the stage here and His there. Top five so like four of them. It was really nice to see that Bauhaus was able to step up to to the front level sprints after being stuck in the in the what what can I call it? The the B Tech sprint category. Yeah. <laughs> the tour of Croatia, the the Hungary. Those kind of races, he would be doing the sprints in those races. And to see him step up to this level and being able to top five sprints shows that he's on that level. And I also feel like they did well in keeping Bauhaus up there in sprints, like you said, like the Mohoric one in that stage where Jakobsen fell. That was yeah. a really good, really good stage for Bahrain when it comes to positioning. But Bahrain aside, what is another team for you that really, really knocked it out of the park? Uh, Kofidis, obviously, you know, the 15-year drought broken by two top Two, two stage wins from two different riders, plus Guillaume Martin wins the Zabeldia Award. He gets top 10 in, in the GC without being on TV for three weeks with, <laughs> with you know, doing it on his own. I'm not mocking Mate. him. I'm saying good on him. No, he this guy doesn't ask for any team support. 
He doesn't demand which riders come to the tour with him. And he gets him breaks and does his own thing. And he comes top 10. Good on him. I saw him three times, I think, this week. Two times where he was bridging to a breakaway that already established. Yeah. Last minute and bridged towards it. And it worked. And the third time was at the back of the group doing a Louis Mankies, trying to hold on for his dear life. And that's what you need to do, eh? Those are the things you need to do. You need to make sure you try and go in breakaways that might make it to the finish line. And he did that. And on the other end, you need to try and make sure you can hold on whatever it, whenever you're not in the breakaway. So it was really impressive by then. And when it comes to the Cofidis route, are you, are you surprised that Lafay was kind of invisible after stage? I reckon, he's getting, I reckon he's getting pissed every night. <laughs> Possible. <laughs> Well, did you hear what Walshide had to say? Yeah, um, yeah that's from Walshide said he's like a he's like the old school cyclist, like a rock star. So, and I'm not <laughs> even listen. If you're a French rider, you win in the Grand Depart stages, break Covetous, yeah, wind drought. Why can't you get drunk every night? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they even care. Also, on Guillaume Martin, he helped a lot in that Isagira stage win on stage yeah. twelve. He was marking moves. He was excellent. So th their teamwork was good. Obviously, Lecoq, uh, I would, you know, I would love to him to win a stage, but you know, he finished third in the points as well, the intermediate sprint, uh, not the, the the green jersey competition. Zangler, maybe I hope for a little bit more talented young French rider from the Alsace region on Cofidis, but you can't have everything. Uh, and for their budget, you know, they got to be happy. Asia Two R also, they just keep winning stages uh, as well. And Gull could have, you know, top ten GC. You know, it's not O'Connor. After third in the Dauphiné, again, they probably would have hoped for maybe top five, but a stage win in the Queen stage, goal, top ten, good yeah. teamwork. I don't actually know who else was in their team, i got to be honest. In Aja Zer, Ben O'Connor, Gull, Nassen was in there, he was the guy riding for a bit oh, when Berthe, they were trying to get good. Gull into the top ten on that random stage where everybody was roasting them for trying to get Gull from 13th to eventually 16th at the end of the stage, but they were trying to get him into the top ten. <laughs> But in the end, it, it worked out, but that stage, the tactic doesn't get saved by the result of this race, of course. I, I am super impressed by Gull. We'll talk a bit more about him in, in one of the next topics, but there's just a lot of teams that overperform, oh, like Little, you would argue one. as well. Go ahead. Did you know Benoit Cosnefra was at this race? I saw him once, and that's Why are they paying it. this guy? They just Actually, extended a lot of money. Him. He'll be on heavy seven figures. Yeah, he's definitely above seven figures. A French the rider guy, on a French team. Did he team. get in a break? <laughs> uh, he tried getting in the break uh, two days ago on the second last stage to counter Ciccone, which was super weird. Man. Anyway. Right, At least he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to hear as a cyclist, eh? <laughs> you don't perform, but at least you seem like a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like you perform like that and then you get a two-year extension on millions of yeah. euros it's like fucking hell insane um, anyway he Actually does win insane. races occasionally app also you know i, I want to i like app the 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 pp brothers but um he also had a tough tour de france but he was yeah. good earlier in the year so anyway uh julien jardy goat ds best ds in cycling i want to see a tattoo with felix gull on it he is. on he's his back it. next time is he that's crazy he said he's getting it <laughs> little bora also teams that are probably going to be proud of their performance. Hindley had bad luck, so Bora can't be, yeah, can't be overly sad about the fact that he still ended up seventh after that crash on his hip and so forth. Wore the yellow jersey for a day, won that stage. I think they, I think they won another stage with Jordi Mays on the Champs Elysees. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty big win. Little with yeah. their polka dot jersey and so forth, winning a stage with Peterson as well. Next to that, I think they can be happy as well. But there's also some teams that were absolute wrecks in this race. If Moscon was a team, <laughs> oh, nobody would have known he was in this race. But the same kind of counts for Arkea. Mozzato got top 10s in sprints, top 12s in sprints. And Sean Poussin was completely invisible. Um, and for the money that he gets, he probably should be being relatively visible. Wow, that and... was good. What, sorry? Buggy was pretty good. He was in breaks, but uncompetitive. But he's always you know, isolated. So... Yeah. It's so hard in those breaks when you're on your own. And for the rest, like, well, Arkea just, I don't know, they might as well have not started this race. Do they need Lopez or Quintana? I'm telling yeah. you. DSM? Ast Astana, I don't want to... Ast Cav did look pretty good, and they yeah. were getting better. It's tough when you're all around a sprinter, he crashes out. It's like, can yeah. you really roast them? Yes, you would like ideally the other riders to perform, but 
they were around one rider. But yeah, DSM, Benji, I feel like, yeah, they had a shocker. They had a true shocker. And I think it's also a team car problem because like issues like not going around the roundabout the right way in a sprint lead out, you can make that mistake once as a rider. But if it happens every sprint, then I'd argue it's probably because the, the riders weren't aware that they had to go on one side of the roundabout instead of the other. And other situations as well as that, Bardet just wasn't on the level. And he was probably sick in the first two weeks, but then eventually also crashed out on stage 14, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And but he's always sick. Yeah. It's, except for the, well, okay, okay, he also got sick on the Giro last year, so at that point, I can bin. But um, for Mark and Dinam, I reckon we're pretty good surrounding Mark him. Mark was but, good, yeah. They were good for young guys, I thought. But they can't get results at this point, you know? So it's kind of like... They were good, but they weren't able to show anything for it. And they've got the least use of UCI points of any team in this race. So didn't gain much from that either. I've got Arkea and DSM at the bottom in the mud, in the bin at this race. But there's also some teams that you probably you probably want to go on a roundabout group, Pama, don't you? Oh, no, I'm all spent up. I've already said it all. It's all the same <laughs> I've said before. Like, it's just <laughs> what happened happened that we, we expected. You know, Gadu, you know, he came ninth. But As expected. Yeah, like, I thought he would come 7th to 10th. That's fine, whatever. Um, Gino got in some breaks, super strong legs, didn't make right decisions at the right time, so didn't win. Um, but, you know, it was a nice send-off on stage 20. Like, still was good that he was up there, but, yep. you know, Madawaz and Kung either... Like, Kung just doesn't perform at, at the power he has in Grand Tours. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether what, what the issue is, but yeah, they, you know, you don't bring DeMar and half the stages suit him, then this is the result. So anyway, um, I, like it's not a criticism either of Lars Vandenberg. I thought he was mm -hmm. actually quite good in a couple of breakaways. But yeah, Pacho and, Pache and Legac and Genius weren't good. Yeah. Um, and you should have taken DeMar. But EF also, you know, a lot of their riders, they did have Carapaz crash out on yeah. stage one, who would have been probably gone for a breakaway stage win and might have won one, probably would have. That always hurts. Same with Movistar with Mass. Uh, but yeah, the, the, a lot of the team just didn't. Uh, also, Chavez DNF, Shaw DNF on and crashes, I think, in stage 14. So that hurts too. But Court was nowhere. Uran was was not really that good. And, and Betty Ol was relevant in a couple of stages at the back end of the third week. And I would say that there's just so many teams like that that had their rider crash out in a similar way when it comes to Carapaz. So Movistar lost Moss, for example. Then Anton Marche lost Mankies, who was also in the top 10. Then Quickstep lost Jakobsen, but then again, he wasn't showing it really anyway. Astana, probably helped Gavin, them. you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, it probably got them the stage when it was green. <laughs> they won too. <laughs> exactly. So I don't know. I still don't, I, I still don't feel like Quickstep saved there. Tour de France because I think they should be getting at least two stage wins with the team that they have on the on the big roster. But hey, they got what they have, and that's kind of how I I view the team so far. The rest of the teams are kind of like the middle pack, I'd say. Didn't overperform, didn't underperform. Obviously, Yumbo, Alpecin, and UAE are at the top. Hey, eh? that's that's the obvious ones. That's why we don't didn't go in depth in these right now. We'll go a bit more in depth towards the end of this podcast in those teams. But you reckon you had a, a Derek Jeter's Tour de France like? That kind of rider that broke out in the Giro, someone like that in the tour? I thought it was going to be Nalens. Again, another Israel rider, but then he, he did get tired and he wasn't able to keep going in, in week three. Because uh, Nalens, on that stage where he got caught by um, the stage Bilbao one, was it stage 10? Uh, he was... Nalens was just... He couldn't feel the chains. So Nalens was really, really good. They extended him. That was probably from before the tour. Uh, and then there's also, you know, Gull... It's one thing to do it in the Tour of Alps. It's one thing to do it to the Swiss. And it's like Schelmoser kind of didn't corroborate his performance from Tour de Suisse. Uh, he was very good and, and a great teammate for Ciccone, but it's sort of what happened happened. But Goal kicked on and got even better from Tour de Suisse. So I think Goal is the probably the breakout, even though there were already signs. Johannesson was good, but Lafay also... Yeah, Lafay is a difficult one because already yeah. I thought he was very, very good. Um, consistency, I question. The Volscheid comments, whilst they are funny, I think if you look at his consistency and how he, can be, how he can be so good 
So good. He's literally with Pog and Jonas on the code to PK, no one else, and attacks them. And then, and listen, maybe he goes to Montreal and Quebec and wins, wins there. Maybe he, maybe he goes to, uh, and wins two uh, podiums, Italian classics, yeah. and he was tired during the TDF. I don't know. Maybe he kicks on, but the Volshard comments in, with the consistency, it's like, are you cause, kind of like causing for, I don't know. Um, so I, I, like, I'd go with Gull almost. It sounds like Lafay is the kind of rider that if you switch him towards a team that takes everything super seriously, that forces him to follow his training program and so forth then you either get a rider that doesn't enjoy cycling or you get a rider that gets the step up that, for example, Laporte had when he moved to Jumbo Visma. Yeah, he might hate it. And he might only yeah. perform in a relaxed environment. Not everyone... Exactly. Not everyone can do the Jumbo Visma living on Tayde every, every year. It's, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. Um, but I'd be interested. I hope he stays at Cofidis and they, they can get some cash yeah. to keep him. Uh, French Tour de France stage winner. I think it'd be great if he stayed there and I'd love to see him at the Arden again next year in their colors. Uh, Gal, yeah, who, who's your breakouts? Those no, guys? No. Those names were definitely on the list. Carlos Rodriguez is definitely worth mentioning after the GC step up he made. Yes, he ended up fifth after the crash on stage 20, but the thing with Rodriguez as well is he actually had like two Grand Tours where he stepped up and performed. And at those Grand Tours, he crashed heavily in week three. And dropped in GC spots in the last week, which is really sad, actually. Last year with the Vuelta, dropped to 7th after being in the top 5 and so forth, and this year we've got the Tour de France, and there's loads of rumours when it comes to their transfers. Even La Five, for example, there's rumours about him, there's rumours about, about Rodriguez, and the thing with him is that I heard something about there being a, a pre-contract or something, but no written contract yet with Movistar, so... And I also heard some internal issues with the transfers and so forth that Ineos, so it's all very curious of where things are going to go, whether they're going to re-sign Carlos Rodriguez, whether he goes to Movistar. I reckon if you're Ineos, I would kind of like keeping Carlos Rodriguez after this Tour de France. What else are you going to do? I don't know, man. Hope Pitcock actually steps up. Um, I think, yeah, they got to keep do their best to keep him. Uh, he's 22 years old and might have finished fourth in the Tour de France. Where not for he does crash a lot. He has yep. good handling, but there's like the 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 yin and yang to that is he seems to take a lot of risks or crash a lot. He did say he had a broken front wheel though in that crash, but there's been a lot of other crashes too, including the Vuelta last year. I would say the Yates brothers, they they're the thirty year old breakouts because um, they actually <laughs> they both had outstanding Tour de France. Yates finishing on the podium. Uh, for the first, I should probably read out the top 10, actually. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get there. Um, in terms of GC, yeah, Vingegaard winning by 7.30 ahead of Pogaccio, Adam Yates, yeah, third on 10.56. It's a big gap, but still, his first ever Grand Tour podium, and it's on the Tour de France at UAE after moving from Ineos, and his brother Simon Yates in fourth. Uh, so yeah, they both had very, very good Tours de France. Um, that's GC, Benji. Vingegaard kind of had the, it's not really much, he just was so solid. I just, yeah. like everything went to plan. There were a few, maybe a few concerning moments on Juplan uh, when Pogacar attacked. It's like, is he going to lose a lot of time here? But he came back. I think he, you know, Jumbo took a risk sending Rolich to the Giro and not to the Tour de France, but in the end it, uh, it paid off and now they have yeah. both. So what do you think they do? Do they need Roglic at the Tour? Well, it was a gamble, eh? Choosing to divide them, divide the, the power there, but it was probably also people management involved in that decision. And then being split up between the Grand Tours bothers the question, can they actually win both Grand Tours? Can Roglic beat the likes of Evenepoel, the likes of Thomas? He ends up winning that race. Then we come here and we're like, oh, can, can Vingegaard do it without Roglic? And towards the Tour de France and the preparation races with Pogacar's injury and so forth, the sign was to the fact that Vingegaard would actually have a chance of winning the Tour de France. Like, they were relatively 50-50 in the betting odds. In some countries, Pogacar was ahead. In some countries, Vingegaard was ahead, how I viewed it at least. And I think if we take a look at how Jumbo did it throughout the Tour de France, Vingegaard was very solid. He had wobbles left and right, but Pogacar did as well. And the, the wobbles that Pogacar had were of a, a much more severe magnitude than the ones of Vingegaard. I would also say that if Pogacar didn't have his wobbles on Marty Blanc 
and on the Code La Law stage, he still wouldn't have won this Tour de France because the time trial difference was so significant. And taking a look at how this third week wobble of Pogacar could have, could have existed, I want to um, maybe go over it for a second. So how we see this stage was in week one that Pogacar was very explosive, right? We see it on multiple stages. They kind of played with the pretender role that Yates is a, a GC rider, a potential threat to Vingega. I don't think Jumbo super believed that they should be afraid of Adam Yates throughout this race. Maybe in week one they were a bit wary, but I wouldn't say they were overly scared either that Vingega would be dropped by Adam Yates by the third week, for scared. example. <laughs> Mate, I feel you, you thought Adam Yates was the second coming <laughs> of Jesus Christ, so... <laughs> but um, <laughs> if we then go further, we see that Jumbo Visma applies a strategy, how I viewed it at least, where they try and make stages more difficult. Every big stage, they try and make difficult from the start, whether it's pacing, whether it's satellite rider up front to try and get the race rolling early on so that it doesn't really stop. That for me looked like they were trying to reduce the attack that Pogacar has on the last climb because they realized on Pididon, for example, that when the gap is created, then there's separation, and then Pogacar might be climbing at the same time as Vingegaard. So if they can reduce the, the initial separation that Pogacar can make by making the stages harder, then they might be able to benefit. And on, on the Juplan stage, I felt like a lot of people were saying, oh, this is a win for Pogacar, that Vingegaard didn't drop him here after an entire day of, of racing. But I felt like it was the opposite. I felt like it was a a point towards Vingega at that day because he was able to come back after Jumbo successfully reduced the attack of Pogacar. And I saw that as a light point for week three. And I, I'm not going to say that... When it comes to Kodalos, for example, Pogacar falls completely through the ice. He loses five minutes. I think Jumbo has an effect on that by the fatigue that they build up in the stages beforehand. I think they had a bit of help with the likes of Inez and so forth pacing on that stage itself to make it harder as well. But I also did not expect Pogacar to fall through the ice that early on Code Lalos. So it's like, is there something on Pogacar's end, on UAE's end, in the preparation and the nutrition and stuff like that, that makes it that on every major queen stage of the last three years, he falls through the ice. He did it on Vaughn 2, 40 seconds lost in the span of one to two kilometers, roughly. And then we go a year later, we see on Grano, similar fashion, falls through the ice towards the end of a hard stage after a relatively rough few stages. And this time around, rough few weeks in front of a, a very big queen stage, and then he falls through the ice again. What do you reckon, man? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I saw Juplan was, as you said, kind of the, the turning point where, okay, he stalled. He stalled at the end of that attack. Vingegaard came back to him. Of course, everyone was saying, oh, the motos, they, like, the moto blocked Pogaccia. And, you know, it, it, I don't think it ended up changing the Tour de France result. Maybe it did, that no. motorbike blocking Pogaccia. Um, Seven minutes difference of blocking. <laughs> but, um yeah, that seemed to be a turning point to me. And then on Lebetex, I was pretty sure it was done, actually. When, when he let Yates' wheel go, huge weakness. Huge sign of weakness because it made yeah. no logical sense. And then Vingegaard basically outsprints him in the finish and stops, looks at him, and lets Pogaccia roll, roll across the line first. I was like... He's going to get cooked on lows because that's about five times harder than the Betex, which is actually was a sneaky hard stage. And so, yeah, I don't know. Like UAE come out of rest days pretty, I don't know, pretty bad. Like uh -huh. stage 10 after first rest day, Pikachu said that was like the hardest stage of the tour so far after that stage. And that was a break. That was the one Bilbao one. What, the stage de Foix last year in stage 16 on Pagare, he looked like shit. And yep. then the TT, not good. Uh, and not his best TT. And then Lowe's, yeah, terrible, obviously. It is noticeable that it's one or two days after the rest day every time, eh? Because, like, yeah. 
The three queen stages Bernal. where he drops is two stages after each rest day. This might be complete conspiracy theory, but the pattern is there, so it's it's probably useful to take a look at it if you're UAE to see if there's something with I think you mentioned it at some point, maybe nutrition on a rest day, for example. Can that lead to this? I mean, like the hot takes, the real hot takes is like the backflip in the pool on the rest day is why he lost six minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, is there, it's, people literally said that. I think Schleck or someone really said it. It's like, come on. Like, <laughs> you can pick anything you like like that. Um, I don't know. It's obvious. He, yeah, he struggles on the super hard stages. And, um, because like, if it, yeah, if you have a crisis, that's the thing. If you have a crisis there, because like Vingard didn't really have a crisis when he got no. dropped. On Puy de Dome, Vingard was still good. He loses eight seconds. On Caltere, he was still good. He attacked on Tourmalet 60 kilometers out, attacked him on Gain on Caltere, flicked himself. Yeah, but. And, you know, so Vingard doesn't really have these huge problem moments. Yeah. He doesn't have those major wobbles. And I think the major wobble that he had was Caltere, where I think the mental side of things was the one that hit more than the physical side because at that point he just had Muddy Blanc he thought he was top notch much better than Pogaccia Pogaccia wasn't on the level that he needed to be and then on Tourmalet he can't drop him and on call today he's starting to slowly realize it's starting to sip through his brain like fuck this guy's much better than yesterday and that he drops him there and then I think the larger gap was created because Vingega mentally was like Fuck, 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 fuck. I think that that went through his head at that moment. And I think that's something that's underrated on call today. While on Puy de Dome, for example, he might have been able to switch that button a tiny bit and already start thinking, okay, I need to make sure I can hold on. And I think that's the difference between those two stages. But like, you mentioned Roglic. Like, Vingard just won the Tour de France. They don't need Roglic next to Vingard no. to win the Tour de France. They've proven it. Simple there and then. Would I like to see them both in a Grand Tour against the Yuzo, Pogacar, and Lameda? Fuck yes. <laughs> I want everybody to come to the Four Tour de France next year. Every single soul needs to be in that race. Eddie Merckx can unretire on Lotto Sudal, and I'd love to see it. But <laughs> I, think, uh, I think they don't necessarily need it. Would it have made the Tour de France easier to win for Jumbo Visma? Probably a tiny mm. bit. No, I don't think so. Really? It's almost easy. It's almost easier looking after one leader. Mm -hmm. You got the sprint stages, for example, mm -hmm. and this this didn't play any role. And this is an, a now a discussion point of what UAE might need to change. Like, yeah, we, ver, thank God, fortunately, but typically you do. There was no sprint crash this year. Yeah, usually in one of these stages, from fifteen k's to go or twenty k's to go to three k's to go, there's a crash. Because that's yep. just the reality of life. And there wasn't this year really a major pileup, which is unusual. And maybe it was because they had such a hard Basque Country start. I think that was actually good. Um, but UAE were in terrible position. They even gave up trying. And Vingegaard was always at the front. In the end, it was a waste of energy for Yumbo. They got no benefit for it because there was no issues. And actually UAE got to, got to conserve. But... If you're looking, I don't think you can just say, ah, oh, well, it wasn't a problem this year, so we don't need to change the team next yeah. year. Uh, that's been a problem for Roglic. Vingegaard, I think, holds the wheel better. But for UAE, they got to get in a ruler. We've been saying it, what, for two years? Yeah. they got to get in some better rulers because Björk, um, Björk, Trenton is probably leaving as well. Mm -hmm. Björk and Langen, they, first of all, cannot do that job in the final 30Ks, and they cannot manage a break formation to save their life. Exactly. And they need that rider not solely for the positioning, like you mentioned, sprints, but also for that breakaway formation to try and close down bigger groups that try and bridge to the group ahead. Because we mentioned this before, an ideal breakaway formation control phase for a, a GC team, if you want to control the breakaway, is smaller group goes ahead, and then you try and prevent the groups that try and bridge to the breakaway to actually get separation from the peloton by having a rider smoothly close down the gap towards that bridging group. That's kind of the process you see there. And if a Yumbo jumps, you try and neutralize that in a similar fashion or try and jump with him, depending on what you desire from that stage. And we don't see that when it comes to UAE. They don't necessarily do that. We saw Soler, for example, on stage 20. While he had to do small fleet closing bridging groups, what he did was jumping to the group and then realizing he did it wrong and then dropping back and then starting to pace that group. 
That was messy. And that's not the stuff you want to see. That was on a climb, though, so it's understandable that Soler does that and not the likes of Langen. But I will say that the rumors of Nils Paulet going to this team are very good rumors, and they need a rider like that in this team 100%. He would be able to pull this off. And I wouldn't even mind if they had two Nils Paulets in their squad. Because one can't do the break formation phase alone. And when you look at Jumbo Visma, they've got multiple riders that can do that. Van Baal is a good ruler. Van Hoydonk is a good ruler. Laporte is a good ruler. Van Aert could, could fucking do it if he needed to. So they have like so many riders that can do this role while UAE kind of has no one that is able to do it properly. But is it also not... Is it just a rider issue? Or no, do you reckon it's, it's a tactical a issue? Because you remember what they said on that, on that, what sounded like a meme radio com communication thingy where they said, uh, jump with the tigers or something and then follow the crocodiles, something like that. That was about the breakaway formation. It was in the UAE video they had on YouTube, how they explained that. So their plan was simple. They jump with Jumbo Vismas and they follow if riders in the top 10 and so forth, try to go and breakaways. Why? Like, Why I don't do know. you care if David Gadu gets in the break? I don't care either, but on the third part, I think you can have issues with the first two, but the, the major issue for me is that there's not a third part that says we need to smoothly control bridging groups to the breakaway to make sure the break isn't large. Because there were multiple stages where they ended up chasing a 20 plus, 25 plus man group that could have been an eight man group. Because they spend twenty minutes chasing three man groups. Look at yeah. look at the Al the Vosges stage. Soler was closing down groups of three. It was like Chicone, Schielmoser, and like a, an EF. Yeah, and it's like, dude, it's three guys. They're gonna kill themselves going for KOM points. It, this is the it to me. UAE came out with the plan for stage twenty that they were never gonna even allow a breakaway to form. Yeah, on the foot, I was like. That's impossible. You cannot ride the whole stage like that. Um, now, in the end, they did bring back, well, Kelderman had to help, but, um, <laughs> but they were strong enough. And that's because their climbing squad is really, really good. Like, you look at Micah, Groshart, the Yates, Soler, excellent, excellent climbing squad. And Yates was, you know, to have the guy come in third as a domestique. He must be climbing pretty well. So on that mountainous stage, they could do it. But to not be able mm -hmm. to control a break, on 140k Grand Colombier Uni Puerto, when you really want to win the stage, yes, it's not good. Um, but yeah, I think. But otherwise, you know, uh, there's not too many apart from Pollitt. There's not too many like Kung's not on the market. The Yumbo guys, like they, they should have gone for Laporte. Um, <laughs> like stole but him. Yeah, Kung was on the market. Soren Kurt Anderson was on the market. They have the money to sign those riders, but they fell last year, so they yeah, didn't they prioritize they those signings. They don't match their compound score thing, so they just signed yeah. Sivakov. Like what? <laughs> Sivakov is a nice rider, don't get me wrong. How does he improve their chance of winning the Tour? I think, I think it adds another climber to the, to the system that won't necessarily move the needle. I think maybe he performs better than a gross Gros-Shartner, maybe ups them by like 1% in the and train, but it won't necessarily help them win the Tour de France because at that point it's all about Pogacar to be able to be better than Vingegaard. Because I think the teams are strong. Both teams are the strongest teams at the start line, roughly. So we're looking at these against each other and Vingegaard didn't win this Tour de France because Jumbo Visma was the better team over UAE Team Emirates. They probably were. Oh, they were way better. Yeah, but it, it wasn't the reason that Vingo won. Vingo won because he straight up 1v1 beat Pogacar over three weeks. With nah, support of their teams. Vingo, I don't think so. Look how nervous he is in the bunch. If, I think if he doesn't have these super rulers creating a bubble around him, who knows what could happen. Um, like, I think if he's on Bora, I don't see it. Uh, I really think like having Van Bala, Van Hoydonk and Laporte keeping him safe in the pocket. It makes it, you don't really see it because it's in a different stage to the mountain stage, but I think it makes a big difference. Um, conserving energy, keeping him safe, keeping him calm. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, I'm hoping next year that Ineos and a quick step can join the party. I don't want it just to be UAE versus Yumbo. 
uh, Remco has to go to the Tour 2024, whatever team he's on, whether if that's Ineos, <laughs> if they believe the rumors. Um, I know Israel is also da- mentioned. Oh, come on, man. Um, <laughs> I know Davy B. Davy B. was back at the Tour coincidentally when they won their two stages. So I'd love to see them get back in the fight, uh, as well as uh, Quickstep or another team. Maybe maybe Bora, maybe Urtebrooks. Who knows? These young guys progress so quickly. But uh, yeah, is there any anything else from? I guess we'll see Vingegaard at the Tour with at the Vuelta with Roglic. That'll be a I really, if we want to see Remco against uh, the Yumbo duo, that'll be uh, it's pretty appetizing with Ayuso. I think Ayuso will also do the tour next year uh, with Pogacar or, or without. I think with Pogacar. Um, but yeah, a- anything else, Benji, from the tour that you'd like to highlight? I think I do want to talk on that for a little bit. Jonas Vingegaard going to the Vuelta is a, is a pretty major thing because Pogacar hasn't had a year where he rode two Grand Tours yet. Thinking on making this step after winning two Tour de France's is for me a really good step in my eyes. I, I, I love when a rider wins that Grand Tour, realizes there's a bigger picture at Jumbo Visma that they couldn't win all three Grand Tours and then steps up to do that again in the third Grand Tour in the year. As a co-leader with Roglic, yes, there is a chance out there that they absolutely dominate GC and it becomes a boring race into, into the second week. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a certainty. Because Vingal's doing his second Grand Tour in a year. We don't know if that's going to affect him or not. Cuz might be there in his third Grand Tour in a year, which... GC Cuz, do it, please, thank you. Roglic is coming back. He's not the Roglic he was three years ago, but he is still fucking good. And there is still competition throughout... While there's no Pogacar, which I found really... On one end, it's really sad, but on the other end, I, I would understand if they do it to try and figure out what happened in the third week of the Tour de France. If that is the reason no, to try no, and build what, towards next that's year, that's not the reason. What is the reason? Because like points and keeping our so happy. They want they want Pogacar to do the Canadian classics, all the Italian classics, and get loads Fuck of Canadian points. classics. Fuck Lombardia. A lot of points. Like I love Canadians, and I love that they love having it was a race actually a there. Great race last year, both of them. Yeah, but nobody remembers the Canadian classics a week after they existed. I remember. I remember Pogacar torching Van Aert in Montreal and Benoit. Benoit got Yeah, the even though I abused Benoit at the start of this part, it was a great <laughs> win in Quebec. And then he went missing for another year. Maybe we'll see him back in Quebec. Um, yeah, like I, Plouet, I, I, I but think in Canada. Point. I think Pog will do Plouet. Eh? For points. I don't care. I bet you. And that's why they're doing it, to win the UCI ranking. And also because, yeah, Don upset the apple cart with Ayuso, who's been promised well to leadership uh, since the start of this year. And that's what Machin is. He says a lot, and he's true to it. He says that they have a lot of guys with a lot of ambition, you know, and they yes. try to keep them all happy. And they've so far given a lot of guys their own opportunities. But I think what he said is also not ideal either what he said after the Tour de France when Vingegaard announced that he went going to the Vuelta. Machin said, that they won't adapt their plans according to their competition. I think that's a public statement. I think behind the scenes, they relatively often change their plans according to what Yumbo Visma does and so forth, in the same way that Yumbo Visma adapts their plans according to what UAE does every Roglic now and, and then. Roglic avoided themselves, avoided each other for two years. <laughs> yeah, it was, exactly. It was so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but, for example, Vingegaard going to the Vuelta, it was probably already planned. It was already planned yeah, probably yeah, since, yeah. since the winter or something. But, it's also good that they follow through with it. And when it comes to Pogacar not going to the Vuelta, I think they're all reducing their chances of winning the Vuelta with Ayuso. For sure. By not having Pogacar next to him. For sure. I mean, yeah, Vingegaard might be in his Crow race form and then it's not so much of a problem. He might be in his Basque Country form and then, and then you got Mate. Roglic. Yeah. Only's coming. <laughs> exactly. Oscar Only will win the Vuelta. Um, and Max Poole. But you have... Roglic is doing... This is the first time in... Three years, he's doing a proper preparation for the Vuelta. So it's not like he was that bad in the Giro. So yeah. he's doing a proper prep for the Vuelta with, without crashing out of the Tour de France. You got Vingard. Now, Ayuso is on his own. No, I mean, Jay will be there. Uh, I, I pretty better. My man, Joao Almeida, the legend himself. Oh, true. Almeida will be there. But what yeah, do you would reckon? You, would you take Vingard and Rolich or Almeida and, and Ayuso? 
I'll make it on a Yuzo because it's yeah. much more fun. <laughs> yeah, it is much more fun. <laughs> I'll rather be on. I'll rather be on that bus watching <laughs> how, how they plan that. Um, but yeah, I can't wait for that. But yeah, it's going to be a cracker. And they, poor old Dave Nepal's like, Jesus Christ, why is it? <laughs> but to your point on Pagachi, I think the Vuelta is his best Grand Tour. I think it suits him the most. And um, yeah, I think so as well. You know, when he, if he does Giro Tour double next year, when's he going to do it? I mean, he's only 25, but... Yeah, but maybe not this year it fits in that best. A big Tourmalet stage? A big it's Anglery short. It's stage? One thirty Ks. Short. True. No mount, there's one warm-up climb before Anglerou. It suits him. Yeah, but... There's no I... stage like Lowe's or Grenoble. True. And he'd clean think... up the bonies on all these sprints. If you're the... To... ASO organizer and you see the last two Tour de France and you see this Tour de France, do you adapt it or do you reckon you make it similar to this year or do you make it less with an obvious brutal mountain in the Queen stage to see if it gets closer? Um, I don't know. I have to look at the previous ones in 20, what was in 21? I don't remember, dude. 21 had that Von 2 stage was 200 Ks. Pretty difficult. And then yeah. 2020... Paul de la Lowe's, that stage, yeah. pretty difficult. They have to have one serious mountain stage. They can't just have uni puertos like, uh, yeah. So I think you got to have a bit of both. And if pagach has got to not, I mean, if you lose six minutes, then fuck. Like, it's hard to design a parkour where you can take six minutes back. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, yeah. Anyway, how would you rate this tour? How would I rate this tour to France? I find it very five. difficult. If I take a look at the last Tour de France, Tour de France 2022, I look at that Tour de France and I say, that was a bloody good Tour de France, but in the last few days, it was obvious that Jonas Vingegaard was going to win the Tour de France. There was some wobble in the last week when it comes to Jumbo Visma, the, the stage where McNulty really blew it up and was his strongest self ever. And then Pogaccio was able to, to compete there on the good stage, I'm pretty sure that was. That was, a, that was a big one where I was like, ooh, Maybe there's some hope in having an interesting race here. But it never really got closer from there. Otakam was the final nail in the coffin that, that knocked Pogacar out of the race when he comes to GC. So it was a very good race. And the memorable Granol stage really hits home hard. If I take a look at this year, I feel like loads of stages were really good. But my mind doesn't automatically go to one stage and say, oh, that was a stage like the Granol stage, for example. In my head. In my head, it doesn't happen like that. It's not on that level. Even though I had a stage somewhere in, in the first two weeks where I was like, after the stage where I was like, oh, this was, it was, this was pretty fucking great. But it's, every GC stage here was great because it kept close. And yes, one rider took time on one stage, then another took time on the next stage and so forth. Like the Tourmalet stage was fucking great with Coulter and so forth, Bogaccio winning in the end, striking yeah. back from the day before. That's one stage where I look back and say, that's probably one of the better stages of this Tour de France. Real cyclismo from Jumbo Visma on the Tourmalet. Real cyclismo from Pogacar on Coltere trying to whoop Vingegaard's ass. And it's hard to rate those tours compared to each other. Last year, I would have said Tour de France was, was the best one I've seen in my lifetime. Probably recency buys as well. But I'd say this one is probably not far from it. But I might rate it just under. I think this tour was better. And not just for the GC fight. I felt like every stage, like stage 10 and 12, mm -hmm. these medium mountain breakaway stages were unbelievably exciting and dynamic and people attacking. And, you know, the Yon Izagira stage win, I'll actually remember that. And I thought the Grand Depart was outstanding and so much better than the one last yeah. year as well, the way for they sure. started it. Um, I, I think, and as you said, I agree with what you say. And I can see that in like the analytics of my highlight videos, for example. There's no video that's just like, bam, 1 million views. But the general, and, and for example, like the Col de, de Joux plan stage, in the end, not really a historical stage that I'll go back and watch yeah. like a Grenoble stage. But when you watched it live, because of the narrowness of the GC gap, the tension yeah. in, that, in week two, even though you look at week two, no GC changes in the top two. No real time, much time, just Pogaccio some bonies. But the tension, the feeling that Pogaccio was coming back and gaining time and then Vingegaard fighting back on the Betex, when you watched it live, was crazy. In hindsight, you'd be like, oh, 
but it, when I, I thought it was really, really more stages where they were going at each other. Um, and to be honest, like on Perigood, I didn't really live. I was like, well, yeah, Pog's going to win the stage probably, but two minute yeah. gap, what are you going to do? Um, so the, the closeness of the gap really made it feel exciting live. And then even like the Asgren stage win instead of a boring sprint or the Morridge stage was, I thought, really exciting. So I thought it was really good. Um, and that's, you can see that in the analytics, not just on my channel, but on the, like the Tour de France official channel. There seems to be, maybe, maybe that is the Netflix effect. Maybe they just upped their game. I think it's probably both. But yeah, I thought it was really, really exciting. And the, the, the only stage that I thought was a bit meh was, um, oh, I can't even remember. <laughs> oh, that, that's stage, usually it, the, eh? The stage Amador wanted, stage 11, Amador was the only one that wanted to get in the breakaway and then everyone helped Philipson win the stage in a sprint. I thought yeah. that was a bit, bit tedious. Um, but anyway, yeah. I'd give it a four and a half out of five. Whew. I'd give it a, a 4.43 out of five. Okay, because it, 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 it obviously could have been a five, so the GC gap was even 30 seconds either way into the Alsace stage, then it would have been carnage on, uh, on Saturday, but that didn't yeah, but happen in the end. If we have to be honest, that never if happens. we compare this race to the Giro of this year... Oh my God. <laughs> if I had to score the Giro after having seen the Tour de France, it's about a two out of five. Like, Generous. the Roglic GT doesn't save that bloody race. <laughs> Generous. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Anyway, we hope you all enjoyed the the tour. Obviously, still covering the Tour de France Femme avec Zwift uh, every single stage. So make sure you see our recap later uh, this evening. We've also obviously got World Championships in two weeks. It's much earlier this year. Then a little bit of a gap, and then the uh, the Vuelta a España, which we, as we've already already said, with a bit of a teaser, the start list of that is absolutely stacked so far. So real cyclismo is coming. Um, in the Vuelta, best Grand Tour. So, yeah, I can't wait. And the season's not over yet just because the tour is over. But if you joined us for the first time, thanks for your support, all your support, as always. And uh, to our loyal listeners from years ago, hope you really enjoyed it. We tried our best for the coverage. And uh, here's to another great Tour de France next year. I think we will. I think teams are going to go back to the drawing board and it's going to be a cracker. But until then, ciao.